Welcome back to the Dermalorian podcast from the Dermatology Education Foundation. Thanks for joining us. The Dermalorian podcast is an independent educational program made possible with support from UCB. In our last episode, dermatologist Dr. Ted Rosen provided insights on the management of sarcoidosis and hydradenitis suppurativa in patients with skin of color. In this episode, he continues his focus on systemic diseases in skin of color. Let's listen in as he presents at Durham 2022 on the diagnosis and management of systemic lupus erythematosus. If you talk about systemic lupus erythematosus, African-Americans may be at a two-time risk compared to ethnic groups and other ethnic groups. This is based on retrospective studies from insurance claims data. It breaks out about 40% of those who have systemic lupus are black, 25% Hispanic, and just a little under that, 21% Caucasian. But among black and Hispanic patients with systemic lupus, it's more severe. If you talk about discoid or subacute cutaneous lupus, the prevalence is the same in all ethnic groups, with one small difference the earlier age of onset in African Americans and more scar formation was associated with discoid lupus. Systemic lupus is a little more difficult to recognize in skin of color. What you should look for is swelling, swelling of the cheeks surmounted by some degree of erythema. And you can see that erythema best if you examine the face in front of a blue background. That's how you see erythema best in skin of color. You very rarely find this widespread, deep, dyschromic, really debilitating scarring in any other group except African-Americans. You also, just as in hydradenitis, have to worry about the development of squamous cell carcinoma in discoid lupus in skin of color, because why? It leads to hypochromia. So you have less pigment, more exposure to ultraviolet light and chronic inflammation which we know in anything that's chronically inflamed, like a stasis ulcer that's been around forever, you can grow a squamous cell carcinoma. Lupus treatment. Anytime you see a list this long, as you did with hydradenitis, you know that there's no absolutely guaranteed it's going to work on every patient for every subset of the disease medication. Steroids, of course, systemic topical intralesional immunosuppressants, of course, azathioprine and methotrexate. Rituximab may be helpful by decreasing autoantibody production. Bolimumab and enfrolumab, I'll talk about them in just a second. Mycophenolate may be helpful, but it's not a really great treatment. Thalidomide might be helpful, but again, its rate-limiting thing is the development of neuropathy. Antimalarial agents, not for systemic lupus, but for discoid and subacute cutaneous lupus, treatments of choice, antimalarial agents. Retinoids, both topically and systemically, may help those same cutaneous lupus dis- disorders, discoid and subacute cutaneous. Topical calcineurin inhibitors might be useful for discoid lupus, and pulse dye laser has been helpful. A large menu. Again, Many patients with collagen vascular disease are co-managed with rheumatology. Bolimumab is a monoclonal antibody directed against BLYS, which activates B cells, which make the antibodies associated with tissue damage in lupus. It's given IV. It's not a great drug. It's a modest drug. But interestingly enough, Black patients do not respond to it. Why? I don't know. But you should know that because if you see systemic, this is for systemic lupus, if you see it and it's in a Black patient, this is not a drug to consider because it just won't work. 
On the other hand, anafrolumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against interferon type 1 receptor, so type 1 interference can bind to the receptor, and interferon kappa, seems to, which is a type 1 interferon, seems to be very important for the idiopathogenesis of systemic lupus. So this works pretty well, objective improvement in about half of patients with sustained improvement in those who respond to it. And when they did the studies on this drug, keeping in mind that polimumab did not work in black patients, they made very sure they included a substantial number of these individuals in the pivotal trials to make sure it actually worked, which it does. Before Dr. Rosen dives into the diagnosis and treatment of scleroderma, we pause for this episode's Dermalorian clinical clip. Speaking about the treatment of hair loss during Derm 2022, dermatologist Dr. Adam Friedman provided tips on the use of oral minoxidil. So oral minoxidil, you know, the whole thing about topical came about because they were using this for blood pressure and it turned people into werewolves, which didn't work out so well for those patients. So there, then it was like, well, let's make it topical to avoid those side effects. However, we find at subclinical dosing for hypertension, you still can have the pro hair growth component or promotion of hair growth. And I usually will use maybe about 1.25 milligrams to start half of the small size tab. Super cheap, super accessible. Yes, hypertrichosis can be seen by fine, not so frequently at that 1.25. And it will cause, just like the topical, an initial effluvium when you first start it. So you have to tell patients about that. Just a quick update on biotin. Lots of evidence showing it's not worth it. Does not work. And it can interfere with certain blood tests that could be life-threatening. So I'm not going to belabor this. Just say, no! We'll say no to biotin, but we'll say yes to more from Dr. Rosen. Here he is. Scleroderma can be localized morphia. You may have generalized morphia or linear morphia and coup de sab, usually on the forehead or in the scalp. You may also have systemic scleroderma, progressive systemic sclerosis, which can involve any or all of the organs, and limited systemic sclerosis. Crest syndrome with calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. Scleroderma overall, all forms, all comers, is about 200 per million. So it's a relatively rare disease, more common in women than men, and peaks ages 30 to 55. But let's look at some interesting statistics. If you talk about systemic scleroderma, It's 24 per million for black, 18 per million for white, more common in black individuals. The mean age of onset is younger in black individuals than in those who are not black. If you look at what kind of scleroderma do people have, two thirds of white patients have localized scleroderma, but two thirds of black patients have systemic disease including the often fatal progressive systemic sclerosis. So you can see by these statistics that scleroderma is a worse disease among skin of color, particularly black patients. And then in specifics, based on large case series, black patients are 60% more likely to have cardiovascular or renal involvement than white patients. Black patients have worse pulmonary disease. So it's not just a little fibrosis, it's major fibrosis, major loss of lung function, pulmonary hypertension. And black patients have an 80% increased risk of mortality from systemic sclerosis compared to white patients. Now, if you correct for educational level and you correct for income, that risk falls a little, but it still is increased risk of mortality among Black patients compared to non-Black, particularly Caucasian patients. In skin of color, one manifestation is this confetti-like hypopigmentation, 
usually starts off as a very small spot. And often people think of vitiligo, like the initial manifestations of vitiligo. But when it continues to expand in this confetti-like look, think scleroderma. Start asking about Raynaud's phenomenon, difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, look at the fingers. Ultimately, systemic scleroderma leads to this kind of frozen face. You can't smile. It's difficult to move your lips. You have kind of a frozen look. Oh, and by the way, your wrinkles kind of disappear, but that's not a good trade off. And sclerodactyly, that hard, frozen, I can't bend my fingers look, ischemic digital ulcers at the fingertips or on the dorsum of the fingers, particularly over bony prominences, the knuckles. So in skin of color, think about confetti-like pigmentation as an early manifestation, particularly on the chest. You can also see it on the back. Think about frozen face look. Think about sclerodactyly. Those are manifestations of this disease. Therapeutic options, again, there's a long list. There are some things that are really for progressive systemic sclerosis. There are some things that are best for morphia, like antimalarial agents are best for morphia. They don't do as much for systemic sclerosis. That usually is treated with steroids or immunosuppressives. Bulimumab has been used, rituximab, and matinib have been all used. There's several agents there towards the bottom of the list that are just for lung fibrosis. They kind of decrease existing and prevent future fibrosis. And there are several there that are really for pulmonary hypertension. And then last but not least, kind of experimental, autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So lots of treatments. There are others in the works. There are a variety of auto of immune modulatory. There are antibodies, monoclonal antibodies to various and assorted other things that we think may modulate the disease. So you modulate down those antibodies and you might be better. We're the front line. We are the ones who are going to see these patients first. Often, whether it's sarcoid or it's lupus or it's scleroderma or it's hydradenitis, we are the front line. And we need to make those diagnoses and intervene appropriately and get help when we need it. Dr. Rosen notes that there are potential treatments for SLE in the pipeline. Encouraging patients to use SPF daily can be a challenge. But dermatologist Dr. Julie Harper has some strategies she believes can help patients get on board. In our Dermalorian Derm Decoder, we hear Dr. Harper's strategies as she shared them at Derm 2022. While I'm doing the skin exam, you know, most of the time in our in our EMR, we are putting in there that we're counseling for sun protection, so we better really be doing it, and we better do it anyway. And so while I'm looking at them, I do an open-ended, tell me how you're doing about sun protection now. And they always tell on themselves, you know, first of all, if there's a big, long pause, you know, they're not doing very well, right? Um, some of them will just kind of lie to you, but you, most of the time they don't. They'll say something like, well, I know I'm supposed to use it every day, but I don't. But I use it when I play golf and I'm reapplying at the turn, you know, so they'll kind of tell on you, tell on themselves how they're doing. And it gives me the opportunity then just to stay up, you know, again, the American Academy of Dermatology recommends broad spectrum SPF 30 every day, even on those days that you think you're going to be inside. I have, now this is not perfect. One thing I've tried with my guys, because I think the guys don't do as well as the women on this, and I think that's just because it's part of our routine. So I'll, I'll say to the guy who's struggling with this, maybe you should try like an aftershave product or something that has a sunscreen in it. But I also want you to try this. We're going to be optimistic. Instead of scolding them or, you know, we say, are you doing better about sun protection now than you were, say, five years ago? And invariably, they all say, 
you know, yes, I absolutely am. And then we build on that and I'm like, then, okay, great. I want you to keep moving forward with that. Let's get to every day, let's wear a hat. You know, do you have a long sleeve rash guard for my tennis players, more crew necks. We need things that physically cover you because sunscreen alone is probably not gonna be enough. But I'm so glad you're doing better. You've heard the message, let's keep moving forward. And I frequently, you know, people will cancel us in the summer if they have a sunburn. One of my favorite stories, I have a patient and she's a very sophisticated lady and she has had skin cancer, but she likes the sun. And evidently, I have haunted her. So one day she was, this is a true story, she was laying out on the beach, Miami Beach, and she got her reminder appointment call from my office while on the beach. That is a true story. And she came back and she's like, I can't get away from you. And she told, at least she told on herself, she told the story. But I will tell people, you know what? It is never my job to scold you. You're an adult. You get to make your own decisions. My job is just to remind you and to educate you. But I will tell you, it is never too late. Even though you might think you've already done this, the damage in the past, I can tell, and I believe that, I can tell when people start doing better about sun protection. I freeze less, I biopsy less. It's gonna be a more pleasant visit for you. So it's never too late. It's never too late to catch up on previous episodes of the Dermalorian podcast. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Dermalorian podcast is an independent educational program made possible with support from UCB. For a live in-person learning experience, consider joining us for Derm 2023 August 3rd through 6th in Las Vegas, or join us in Dallas September 30th as the DEF Biologic and Small Molecule NPPA CME Bootcamp Series returns to a live in-person format. Thanks for listening.